Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carey Drisga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I am your host, Dr. Carrie Drisga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments, so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce today's special guest. I am happy to announce my first book is now in print. The title is Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again, Fixing the Root Cause of Your Fatigue with Natural Treatments. I've discovered 14 root causes of fatigue. I like to call them the fatigue factors. And in the book, I explain eight of the 14. I've had some amazing feedback on how easy it is to read and understand. It's not full of technical doctory language like most books written by doctors are. And of course, the book also includes my own personal fatigue story, along with four other stories from real fatigue cases from my private practice. It's available in paperback and Kindle forms. So if you'd like a copy, you can find it on Amazon or on my website, www.drcary.com. That's it for our housekeeping, so let's get started. I'm very excited about this week's show because my special guest is someone that I greatly admire, Melanie St. Ors. Let me tell you a little bit about Melanie. Melanie is a clinical herbalist who draws from diverse healing traditions to help women recover from depression, anxiety, and chronic illness in a truly holistic way. She's the founder of Psyche and Soma, host of the Creative Wellness Podcast, and her private clients come to her from all over the world through the magic of Skype. Most of all, Melanie wants to live in a world where everyone feels free to be fully and unabashedly themselves, a world where where all beings may be safe, happy, and free. Melanie, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Oh my goodness, thank you for having me and thank you for that um, wonderful introduction and congrats on your book. I need to get that from my mom. <laughs> thank you, Melanie. <laughs> Melanie, why did you become a herbalist? And can you explain to our listeners, what does a herbalist really do exactly? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a lot, there's a lot of confusion. It seems like it's very clear for people what a doctor does, maybe slightly clear what a naturopathic doctor does, or a, even a functional medicine doctor. But herbalists occupy this very weird territory that people don't seem to know quite what, what that's all about. Um, and Herbal medicine really is the practice. It's kind of like being a matchmaker. Um, we are like the go-betweens between the world of the plants, which uh, plants are living creatures, living beings, even though they're not, you know, walking around like animals. They each have their own life and their own sort of personality, um, and and human beings and people who are who are struggling with some sort of imbalance or challenge or even just wanting to keep their health kind of in optimal levels. And so as an herbalist, we know, we understand about plants and we understand about people. And the practice is about being a matchmaker kind of between, between those two. And I never would have thought that this would be my profession or my calling. Um, I was trained as an actress and wanted to go into the theater world. And, you know, after many, many years of pursuing that, I sort of started to feel like, you know, gosh, this is really tough and I don't want to be a waitress all the rest of my life. And I kind of moved into the natural medicine world first with massage therapy and body work. And then when I was hit myself with a really severe um, illness, I have ulcerative colitis and I got very, very sick. And this was back before the days of the Affordable Care Act here in the U.S., so I found myself um, working as an independent contractor without any health insurance or any ability to get health insurance. And I got very, very sick and, and near to death before I was able to get health care. 
And at that point, after I recovered, I said to myself, you know, I never want to be that vulnerable again, that dependent on a system that, you know, the, po the politics can change, uh, things can happen, you know, heaven forbid there's some sort of big disaster and the medical infrastructure isn't present. Um, I want to be able to take care of myself using this traditional knowledge and I want to be able to share it with others. So that was really the beginning of my, my herbal path. Melanie, I love that you call yourself a herbal matchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you've had some pretty dramatic experiences with both physical and emotional healing, but what is it about mental health that made you decide to specialize in it? And can you explain to our listeners what herbal medicine can offer people with mental health issues? Yeah, you know, I didn't even tell my other uh, my my other big kind of scary health story, which had more to do with the mental health piece. Um, I had for many years a very um, deep struggle with with depression and kind of mood mood disturbances, and um, even ended up hospitalized at one point. And you know, that was a really demoralizing and, and dehumanizing experience in a lot of ways. And I kept feeling like, you know, yeah, maybe my brain chemicals are out of balance, but like there's more to it than that. Like this is touching my soul and my very self of who I am as a person. And it can't just be about, you know, taking a pill. Like that doesn't feel like that's the whole, the whole answer. And I think it was really that kind, that empathy, that experience that I had of, uh, of suffering with mental illness that really has opened my heart so much to the huge numbers of people who walk around um, every day with, with depression and anxiety, with histories of trauma. And I think more and more, you know, as, as we are recording this episode, um, a very, a very well-loved, famous person. Another, another well-loved, famous person has just succumbed to death because of mental health concern. And I just feel like what we are doing as a society to take care of ourselves and to help ourselves once we get, once we get into trouble, it is just not working. It's just not working. And I'm a big fan of therapy and I'm a big fan of psychoactive medication when it works, but it's not working. And I think the real, the real beauty of what herbal medicine has to offer is that it is that sort of matchmaker um, piece that has to do with really finding the plants that treat you as a person who happens to have anxiety or a person who happens to have depression right now rather than the depression pill or an anxiety pill. And there are a lot of other benefits to many of the herbs that we use for mental health, specifically with the anti-anxiety herbs. Um, they, could, they have such a, a minuscule risk of dependence or addiction. Um, the only one I can really think of that has a, a strong um, possibility for dependence is, is valerian. But all of the others, people, if you have substance abuse history, if you're just concerned about taking something that's potentially addictive, um, the herbs really can step in and, and don't have those potentials the same way that the, the medications do. I'm glad you brought that up because I hear that a lot from my own patients. I have a lot of patients that come in and in their list of complaints is usually something related to mental health, anxiety, depression, yeah. um, panic attacks and whatnot. So it's very prevalent in our society. And over and over again, I hear them saying if they're on medication, they just don't like how they feel while they're on the medication and that yeah. they are afraid that they're going to have to be on it for the rest of their life, like they're addicted to it or something. So I'm glad that you brought up that the herbal medicines, for the most part, are, are vastly non-addictive. They're very mm -hmm. safe to use. And for our listeners, maybe they don't quite understand. A lot of the medications actually come from herbs in the first place. Yes, yes. 
Absolutely. That's the number one um, the number one way that we discover new medicines is by actually looking at traditional cultures and how they what plants did they use that we don't know about yet and um, how can we then kind of take the plant apart, distill it down into just one active ingredient so that we can standardize it and put you know a pill full of that one active ingredient into the body. And the stance for us as herbalists is like, well, why do you want just the one active ingredient? Why don't you, why don't we presume that the plant, the whole plant contains um, a lot of other things that are working synergistically in order to really give us the result? Like for example, do we think that we're really going to be better nourished by taking a pill that has beta carotene in it? Or would we be more nourished by a nice bowl of like steamed carrots with olive oil and some herbs on top? Um, and it's really the complexity of the whole food or of the whole plant medicine that offers the, the gentleness and the full spectrum of nourishment. Yeah, so all the ingredients in the herbs work together. And when we just remove one ingredient and call it the active ingredient and turn that into a medication, that's when it can become so powerful to the point where there can be addiction possibilities and and multiple different side effects. And one of the things that I learned when I was in naturopathic school, and I, I didn't quite understand that before, is that, you know, there is there is a big difference between herbs and medications. So medications never per se fix the problem, but herbs, because of all of their ingredients, actually have the keys to help the symptoms, but also fix the underlying problem. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, different herbs have different personalities. So there are some, like in mental health, for example, um, you know, with people who have a lot of anxiety, sometimes part of that can have to do with underlying nutritional deficiencies. So if if you are taking um, an herb that's really like a quick rescue herb, um, that might not really quote unquote fix the underlying problem, but then you bring on something else, you know, you bring on a nourishing infusion with, you know, stinging nettle or something that maybe it's not, it doesn't do that quick fix part, but it helps with that deep nourishment. And that's partly why we like to use the herbs together in formula, you know, where we bring more than one plant to bear um, in a given in a given medicine. So uh, so yeah, but you're you're absolutely right. There's a more of a full spectrum of nourishment, and it also gives the body a chance. I like to I think of medication like a monologue. This is like my theater background coming in. The medication kind of has a bullhorn and it shouts at your body in one direction, and it works on one pathway and it does one thing. And the herbs, because they're more complex, it's like a dialogue rather than a monologue. It's like someone sitting down and having a conversation with you. And depending on the state of your body, you might you might actually metabolize that herb or work with that herb differently than I do. And herbs have the ability, some of them, to actually regulate and bring the system back to balance rather than only push it to become more overactive or suppress it. I love how you just described that as a dialogue instead of a monologue shouting at you. That yeah. is perfect. Melanie, as you already know, natural medicine is focused on prevention in so many different ways and really on true wellness rather than just the absence of disease. How does this relate to mental health? Are there natural ways to actually prevent depression, anxiety, even stress? Mm, yeah, I, this is such a good question. So I do think that you can anxiety proof and depression proof your life a little bit. Um, and maybe there's no way to really stress proof your life because life happens and that's part of our human condition is that challenging things come up. But what I think we can do is we can work on a quality that that is emerging in a lot of conversations now called emotional resilience. And emotional resilience basically means that you have the ability to 
um, be more like a tree, you know, to bend a little bit in the wind rather than to break when, when something starts to happen, rather than to snap in half under the influence of stress or to have a panic attack or to fall into a depression. And I think part of this really does start with kind of basic self-care and wellness that um, you do need to make sure that you're eating a healthy diet with lots and lots of green vegetables and whole plant foods in there, healthy fats, um, all that kind of stuff. And then we do need to also make sure that we're getting enough sleep at night and that we're getting some exercise. You know, all of those basics have a lot to do with allowing us to be emotionally resilient and preventing depression and anxiety from happening. But then just a little step beyond that, um, beyond those basics, which really like we cannot overemphasize them enough. Like the basics give us so many benefits, even if they're boring to hear about again. But I think the rest of the prevention piece really has to do with kind of emotional hygiene or emotional self-care. And this looks a little different for different people, but I think it's important to have some kind of practice, whether it's meditation or journaling or like doing some kind of five rhythms dancing, which I like to do, or yoga but a practice where you're checking in with yourself and noticing what's happening in your life. Like what are the threads that are weaving themselves together in your life? And, and what, where are you starting to get pinched into a corner that doesn't feel good or who's stepping on your boundaries or where do you need to assert them a little bit stronger? And that kind of self-reflection really tends to get lost in all of the busyness and all of the demands. So I like to tell people to see if they can say no to three things each day or each week, um, if, if each day sounds too hard, you know, say no to three things in order to make some space for that self-reflection and, and journaling, noticing how you're doing. And that way, if things do start to get out of balance, you can catch it earlier and you can reach out for support earlier. Saying no to three things, I really love that. And one of the things that I learned, because I think, um, not to generalize, but we as women, mm-hmm. we tend to really want to to help other people. It's just like part of our nurturing quality. And so we say yes and yes and yes. And I was, I remember watching this interview with Jim Carrey, the comedian, and he was saying, well, when you say no to somebody, you're actually saying yes to yourself. Yeah. And that helped me put a whole different spin on saying no to other people then. Melanie, yes. Melanie, I hope I don't put you on the spot here, but what do you think are the top three things that our listeners could do right now if they'd like to build more emotional resilience? Sure. Well, so the number one thing, and actually let's all do this together right now. So um, Dr. Carey, I hope you'll try this too. I will. Let's, let's just take a couple of deep breaths and notice how we shift or what feels different after we take a couple of big, deep, intentional breaths. So just check in, just notice how you're feeling right now in this moment. And then let's take three nice deep breaths in and exhale with a sigh. So deep breath in and exhale. (sighs) I do think making a sound really helps. Let's do two more on your own time. Nice deep breath. And a deep breath doesn't mean that you have to inflate your chest and lift your shoulders. It just means that your belly is going to come out. Your belly will move out as you breathe in and exhale whenever you're ready. As you exhale, you might feel your belly, belly just sink a little bit. And one more deep breath in and exhale. And let's just notice any shift that's happened just in that one moment of taking a little bit of time to breathe. Have you noticed anything over there, Dr. Carey? I'm definitely sitting up much straighter uh-huh. off this chair, and I feel just more centered and grounded, just more present. Yeah. So that's the beauty of working with the breath. You know, it's free, and your breath is always with you wherever you go. 
there are lots of different kinds of breathing techniques that you can use in order to actually to completely change your nervous system and what state you're in. I have, I have worked with people who are in acute panic attacks. I've done crisis hotline work and I can talk them through a breathing exercise and they will be able to, to be able to carry on a conversation after that and feel a little bit more safe. So it really does work. And that's the first thing I would say is remind yourself to breathe and give yourself just a couple of those breathing breaks every day. That really will help a lot. And then the next thing that I would say is um, to think about think about something that I call the heck yeah and heck no lists. Um, and so the heck yeah lists would be like, what are three things that you love and that are so important to you in order to have in your life to feel fulfilled. So this could be a relationship. This could be a spiritual connection or practice. This could be um, a certain mo a certain time in the day that you like to have a self care ritual, like your your morning uh, your morning tea is non negotiable. <laughs> You've got to have it. Um, or it could be a value that you hold dear, um, something that you really want to make sure that you're working on or working toward in your life. And I like to try to have people start with at least three things on that list. So, and I do want you to write these down. Um, maybe later today you can make some time and write these down, the heck yeah. And then the heck no, these are things that you get asked to do that um, often crop up, but that every time you go to do them, it feels like, ugh, like why do I have to do this? Or why am I hanging out with this person? Why did I agree um, to pick up my friend's kid yet again after school and like turn around and go back and pick up that kid? Like why am I, why am I saying yes to these things? And that could be anything from obligations to certain chores that you have. Like for me, it's cleaning the house. I really hate to do. Um, and really be clear, like write these things down on a list, things that you really don't want to do. And then your job is to see if you can start to, in the outer world, actually say no to those things on the no list so that you have time for the yeses. And just like you said, Dr. Carey, it's not always easy to say no, but when, if we start with the yeses first, if you start with the things that matter to you so much, and then you realize we all only have 24 hours in each day, something has to give if we wanna really be able to do the work that we were put on the planet to do, if we wanna love the people that we're here to love, if we want to spend time with our families, if we wanna be immersed in the spiritual practice, if we wanna learn things, that all requires time and energy. And so it's imperative to start clearing those heck no's out of our life um, as much as we can in order to really make time for the yeses. So those are two things, the breathing and the heck yeah, heck no. And then the last thing that I would say is to make friends with, with some plants. And this can mean a lot of different things. If you, you know, if you have an herbalist that you can consult with, or if you feel comfortable enough to do your own research and maybe find an herb that you would like to work with that matches some challenges that you're having. But it can also mean just starting to grow some plants, you know, get, grow a little herb garden in your windowsill or, um, you know, start to notice, get a little book about edible weeds and start to notice the weeds that are growing around you that actually are powerfully medicinal and really good to eat. And they're just there growing for you freely and abundantly if only you know how to notice them. And I think that beginning to have this relationship with the plant world, even if you never want to be an herbalist, or even if you primarily rely on, on medicine, you know, and kind of functional medicine or on even conventional medicine, um, there is a healing power in simply being in relationship with the plants. And this is something that our modern culture has largely lost, but that has been part of what it means to be a human being for almost as long as we have been human. And so having that relationship 
really is very nurturing. And you can start to realize that if you do have a hard time, if you do find yourself getting out of balance, you have all kinds of friends, um, not just human friends, but plant friends who can be there for you and who can support you in those times of challenge. And it really does help um, to foster. There are a few characteristics of resilient people that I teach in one of my courses, and one of them is interdependence. And having a relationship with the plants really does foster this very healthy feeling of interdependence and being part of the web of life. So to recap, you mentioned the first was breathing to take breathing breaks through your day. Mm -hmm. And the second was to put down in writing your heck yeah list and your Mm -hmm. heck no list, which I, I really love that. And number three was to make friends with some plants and just to, just to, to let our listeners know and, in front of my office, I have two containers that I've planted this year with um, king tut grass, which is papyrus and fan mm. flower. And every time mm. I walk into the office, I look at my containers and I look at the plants and I see, oh, I look at how healthy they are and they're growing. And it just gives me a, a good feeling inside. And yes. when I leave the office, I do the same thing. How are my plants out there? Oh, they're still looking good. And, and they're just so beautiful. And and actually with with what you've taught us today, Melanie, I'm kind of curious to curious to 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 do some research later and see, okay, what are the properties of papyrus and what are the properties of fanflower? Just yeah. to, you know, to see what that's all about. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really curious too. I don't know a lot about those two plants, so that that will be really interesting. Melanie, you've given us such great information today. How can our audience find out more about you? Do you have a website? Do you have a Facebook page? Yeah, 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 all of the above. So um, if you're listening to this show, it's probably because you like podcasts. So I'll tell you about my podcast first so you can add that maybe to your to your listening schedule. Um, I have a show on iTunes called The Creative Wellness Podcast. Um, also available on Stitcher. And you can just search in iTunes for the Creative Wellness Podcast and you'll find it. And then if you want to go directly to my website um, and find out a little bit more about my work or read some articles, get some free resources, I have a nice um, free breathing and stretching practice that is available right now um, that you can actually download and take with you. So that would be a nice resource for for folks as well. Um, that website is psycheandsoma.com. And the spelling is tough. Um, so it's, you know, psyche, like Eros and Psyche, you know, psyche, A-N-D, Soma, S-O-M-A.com. So you can find me there. And then you can also find me on Facebook. You can just look for regular old me, just Melanie St. Ors, and send me a friend request and we can be friends. Or you can also like my business page, which is Facebook backslash Psyche and Soma. And you can find me there as well. And I'll make sure all of those details are in our podcast notes for our listeners. Oh, good, because then we don't have to worry about the spelling, which is always the worst part. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Our listeners, it'll be in the podcast notes. You just you can just click and find all the resources, including the the free breathing exercise report. Melanie, thank you again for being my special guest today. This was an awesome interview. Oh, thank you for having me. And thanks for all you're doing. All right, this this wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Melanie St. Ors. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next week for another special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Kiri Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Kerry is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Kerry is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.